Hello and welcome to Sabbath School Quarterly Commentary. This is your pure gold commentary podcast. And as the name suggests, this is a commentary. It's not a study guide. So grab your study guide if you're not driving or running while listening to us. My name is Morgan Vincent, and this week on the episode, we have Marcial Hernandez. Marcial is a good friend of mine, and he is a pastor on the Caves Beach, Lake Macquarie area of the North New South Wales Conference. And we are going to be discussing the theme of the crucibles that come. And we are continuing our journey through this greater journey or the greater narrative of In the Crucible with Christ. Last week, we were really blessed to have Gavin Anthony, the very author of these lessons, these guides, share the why of what's going on within the crucibles of Christ. And Marcel and I, we're going to be unpacking some more of the crucibles that come. And so let's now go to this discussion. Marcel, I don't know about you, but suffering grips each one of us. Yeah, you're right. Suffering is a present reality yep. that we all suffer in this world. And that's what we're going to be unpacking today. I'm looking forward to it. And, and when we think about it, how are we to make sense of suffering when it occurs to ourselves and also those close to us? You know, some other questions we're going to be thinking about is, are we being punished by a stern, judgmental God? Or, or in fact, are we being attacked by the devil? Or is there actually another explanation to the suffering rather than just being this random situation and experience that we go to through. I guess with this in mind, we're going to be looking at some reasons of why we may suddenly find ourselves under pressure and experiencing hardship. When we consider this, I guess the Bible speaks of trials, these fiery trials. And to launch our discussion today, what do you think? What does the Bible say about these fiery trials that, that we go through as humans? Well, if in First Peter chapter 4, we can find that very same expression that Peter uses like fiery trials. And it's interesting because this term in the Greek comes from the word pedosis, hmm. which means like an intense burning for which metals are refined. So yeah, yeah, that's a very intentional word that Peter used there in that expression. I don't know about you, but when I've gone through trials in my life, at times it can come as a surprise. And for our listeners today, they may be going through a trial right now, no doubt will go through a trial. And it can seem almost a surprise of, okay, if God is good, why am I going through this? And we touched on this with the first episode in, in discussing with Gavin. And it's kind of like, okay, how can we still anchor ourselves with the truth, with the reality that God is a good God, he's a good shepherd. And even though we go through these fiery trials, we go through these refining experiences, God actually is wanting to bring something out of that fiery trial. He's, it's not an end in and of itself, but it's a means to a greater end. That being that God's character would be seen and glorified and revealed through us and through that suffering. And I guess I think as well, with this in mind, we do live in a world of suffering. And at times, there can be things that we can do to prepare ourselves for that, to deal with the suffering when it comes. And I guess keeping this in mind, it helps to understand the meta-narrative, the bigger picture, the bigger story of the great controversy. What comes to your mind with keeping this great controversy in view. Yeah, that's very important. And I really agree with what you were saying. We need to really understand the big picture of the whole thing because we are caught up in this great controversy between Christ and Satan. Mm. And there's a spiritual world that even though we can't see, it is very real. Mm. And on our daily basis, we must continually to connect with God through different things like reading his word, prayer. Like we need to place ourselves in God's care. And then we can trust that whatever happens, God is in control. We need like God-fearing friends as well that are ready to give us like wise, biblically advice and consolate and support us in those times of suffering. It's those practical things that are going to help us because as it is, it's the crucibles that come. It's these times of suffering that will come. And we know that our life in following Jesus, being a disciple of him, it doesn't mean that we are immune or distant or separate from these points of suffering. A verse that comes to mind is when Jesus is on the eve of his crucifixion in John 16, 33, where he speaks of not fearing, taking heart because he has overcome the world. Even though we may go through these trials, he says, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear. Take heart because I have overcome the world. In the world, you will have troubles, but don't worry because I've overcome the world. And so these trials do come to each one of us. And within this narrative of the great controversy between Christ and Satan, Satan is referred to in scripture as a devil, as a roaring lion seeking to devour whomever he may. This is an interesting thing because 
when we can keep this in mind, last week we spoke briefly about Jesus being the good shepherd, and it's that qualifying statement of he's not just a shepherd, but he's the good shepherd, as though there were, may have been bad or evil or vindictive shepherds in the time of Christ. He's saying, no, 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 I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. With that in mind, the Bible also has this illustration of Satan being this lion seeking to devour whomever he may. And with that in mind, the good shepherd says as well, I've come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. But the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. And so if we can keep this in mind, we know that it is not God's intention to unnecessarily cause us to go through these painful, these gripping experiences. With this in mind, the fact that we have this adversary, we have this enemy who is described as a roaring lion. Why do you think Peter uses the metaphor of the devil as a roaring lion rather than some other animal? Mm, do you think? Mm. Why is he using lion, and not a bear or, yep. or a whale or whatever? I don't know. Why yeah, I'm because whale. like <laughs> the lion is regarded as the king of the beast of the, mm -hmm. all the animals, and he's like the top predator of the land animals. And when you watch documentaries about animals and you see the lions, they kill the young and even the less developed animals as well. But even the old and weaker ones and those animals as well that are strong and they're maybe not paying attention, they kill them. But it's interesting that the lion, the lion is not setting traps for all the animals to walk into. The lions, they walk about hunting and searching for the prey. And that's exactly what Satan does in our lives. And that's why Satan is described as a roaring lion. He goes after the Christians to devour them and weak their faith so they can start like complaining or not relying on God as we should. I may be like you, Marcia. I appreciate watching nature documentaries and animal documentaries. And there's a tactic that I've seen lions do. You know, if they're wanting to get their prey, sometimes a lion may decide to attack a whole flock or group of 20, 30, 50 animals. But it's going to have far more success if a group of lions can begin to isolate the prey to be on its own, which begs the question and it bears the thought when we go through our crucibles, when we go through our times of suffering in life, it's actually best not to go through them alone. Keeping in mind that Satan is described as a roaring lion, again, not just a lion, but a roaring lion seeking to devour whom it, like he doesn't care who he takes down so long as he takes people down. So with that in mind, it's so important that we, as we go through these times of fiery trials, of pain, of suffering, of whatever it is we're going through, that we go through it with someone else. Yes, with God. Yes, with his word and prayer, et cetera, et cetera. But that human support that human connection. This bears the thought in mind as well of when we approach and when we are confronted by temptations, the Bible also speaks of resisting. We're to resist and we're to be steadfast in faith. We must be firm in our faith to make that stand because when those temptations come, as James would say, we're not to just stay idle, but we're to flee. We're to run. We're to get out of there, to flee. This bears to mind the thought of what Joseph did when he was confronted with immoral situations and temptations. He literally fled. He just got out of there. With this in mind, Marcel, going along a little bit as well, when we think about the Israelites, the children of Israel, th these were people that saw God do incredible acts of salvation and redemption in bringing them from Egypt. But yet, in spite of them seeing all that, they acted wickedly. And suffering, yes, at times, it, it can come from, from Satan, but it can also come from our human wickedness and the consequences of our sins. Now, with this in mind, do you think the Israelites had, in speaking of their journey as a whole, did they have any excuses for their wickedness, do you think? No, they didn't. They didn't have any excuse. They knew very well what God was requiring from them. And the Bible is very clear. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin mm. is, is death. And sin will ultimately bring death in, in the judgment, mm. but also sin has consequences before that. Mm -hmm. I like what Galatians says in chapter six, it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever man sows that he will reap also. Mm. So we will have consequences for our actions. And I like what someone said once he said, God forgives, but sin doesn't. Oh, wow. And that was, when we think about it, that's powerful because yes, like God forgives us whatever we, sin we commit. But we will carry out those consequences of our sins. We can see that in the life of David as well. He was one of the kings of Israel when he committed the sin, like 
with Bathsheba. Like after that, like God forgave him, of course, but the results that he carried were like very painful for him. Like he repented, but God did not remove the consequences and the mental pain that he went through those things. So yeah, yeah. God forgives sin, but sin doesn't forgive us. And that's the thing. There are consequences to that. And with that in mind, for us today, the story of the history of Israel, of God's people, it's given for our example that we may learn lessons to hopefully through through the power of the Spirit, not go down the same path that they went. And with this in mind, in the book of Hebrews, it speaks of what God does with these trials, what God does to purify us. And it speaks of how, like the testing of our faith, the trying of our faith, but also through this chastisement or this rebuking, God coming to to bring a message, to bring a word, that it actually refines us. It does something for us, which, I mean, when God has to get our attention, he'll do whatever it takes. And the more stubborn and the more we're ignorant or hard of hearing, then God has to resort to, look, I'm just going to tell you how it is. But yet that chastisement, it, it actually works something for us. He chastises us by these trials, by these sufferings, and he purifies us in the same way. And the lesson for us in this is that when we're going through tough times, it's not necessarily the question to ask God, why is this happening to me? I, I do this so often. I'm going through a difficulty and really in comparison to what's going on in the world at the moment, it's not really much of a trial or point of suffering. But nonetheless, maybe the question I should be asking is, God, what are you trying to do in my life? What is it you're trying to refine? What is it you're trying to teach me? So rather than it being this point of, okay, God, I'm going through this. Why? God, what are you trying to do in and through my life? That means then that God will bring certain things to our mind that maybe are blocking us from having a more full relationship with him or hearing where he would want to, yeah, speak into our lives as well. So with this in mind, I guess to bring our discussion to a close, I want to spend just a little bit of time speaking on Paul and his life, his experience. Saul was someone who was a brilliant scholar, who was a brilliant leader, but before his conversion, he was on track to be essentially the leader of Israel. But then through his conversion experience there in the book of Acts, he was now a Christian missionary. He was now someone who was persecuted and despised by many. And this is an interesting thought that blows my mind when I think about it. Of Judaism would have killed the Paul of Christianity, right? Saul was the one that was like breathing down these threats. He was the one that was ordering the killing of these followers of Jesus. And yet through what God did in his life, Paul now becomes the recipient of pain and suffering. And so it's this almost this turn of events. Now Paul is having to rely on Christ. Now Paul is having to realize that, look, I can't look to myself in these trials and in these situations. And Paul has this thorn in his flesh. It's saying, look, I've prayed for it to go away. I've tried to do all I can to have it go away, but it just doesn't seem to go away. So with that thought, what can we do for us today, you and I, our listeners, how can we reframe the suffering and the trials and the thorns that we're going through in life? What lessons can we learn from Paul's example in this? Yeah, you know, like that thorn was like coming from Satan, that thorn that Paul had. And the purpose was to frustrate Paul, to irritate or to annoy him. And God allowed that, God allowed that, that Satan put that thorn there to keep Paul humble mm. and not to become proud. When you were even mentioning before, like Paul, he was a brilliant scholar. He was a leader. Maybe pride could have come Paul's way. And God allowed that situation, that thorn to be there to keep Paul humble. And I think one of the learns that, that we can learn is rather than that complain or just be shaking our face towards God, we should be asking, like you were mentioning before, ask God to show us what are the things that we need to change, mm. what we need to learn from that experience and thank him for being able to be in that experience and the lessons that he's trying to teach us there. Because some of us, we are headstrong mm. and sometimes mm -hmm. like God needs like a drastic measure to get our attention. And for some people, it will be easy because they're not as stubborn as I am, for example. But yeah, we need to be learning and, and just like being humble and just ask God, hey, God, what is the thing you're trying to teach me here? And God has promised actually give us power to go through those difficult circumstances and trials in our lives. 
So we don't have to walk through them by ourselves. But he said, and he has promised that he will be with us, even in the valley of death, Mm -hmm. he will be with us. Exactly. And that's a perfect point because that's what we looked at last week is that these paths of righteousness link and lead and guide us from one environment to the next. And whether it's in the valley of the shadow of death or whether it's having a table set in the presence of enemies, God doesn't say, okay, off you go. I hope you make it to the other side. He says, no, 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 I will go with you through that valley of the shadow of death. And I'm actually the one who has set the table up. I brought the tablecloth up. I brought out the finest plates and cutlery, and I brought the finest of foods. I've set this table in the presence of my enemies. And with this in mind, for us, with Paul's thorn in his flesh, he, I love so beautifully, and it may well be a verse that many of us are familiar with, but for the sake of reminding us and reframing the pain and the crucibles and the suffering that we go through, Paul says these words, speaking of Christ, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And that's what Paul came to realize, that that the grace of Christ indeed was sufficient for him. He prayed, the thorn didn't go away, but he was able to conclude and wholeheartedly believe that the grace of Christ was sufficient for him, that Christ's strength was made perfect in Paul's weakness. This was all so that God would be glorified, he goes on to say. Not that people would see my infirmities, but that God would be glorified through this. And it reminds me as well of another verse in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3. It's a beautiful verse. And here God says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And here as it says in Isaiah 26 and verse 3, that God, God wants us to have our mind stayed and focused and directed on him because as we do that, our mind will then less and less be focused on the trial. By beholding, we become changed. You know, what we look at determines our quality of life. If we're just continually looking at the pain and the suffering and the crucible that we go through, that's really all it's going to amount to. But what is God wanting to do in us through this? Knowing this, that trials do come from different sources, we can have a different reaction. And I guess, Marcel, as we bring things to a close, suffering, it is a reality for all of us. (laughs) Only one day in this planet will prove that to be true. But also as stewards of our own spirituality, we actually need to distinguish between the different types of trials and the suffering to understand how to cope with them and to obtain meaning and significance from them. And so when trials come, we can remember, Marcel, that we're not alone through this. Christ is with us to strengthen us, to endure. And so with all of this in mind, if you're suffering, if I'm suffering, if one of our listeners are suffering, we can remember the promise of Philippians 4.13. What is it? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Marcel, thank you for joining us on our discussion today. It's been a real privilege and we've appreciated your insights and what you've shared with us today. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. If you like the conversation, tell your friends. You can subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or wherever you are listening right now. Sabbath School Quarterly Commentary is a production of the Sabbath School Department of the North New South Wales Conference. This week's episode was produced by Henrique Felix and Morgan Vincent. That's it. We'll see you next week.